Hi everyone, this is Dan Gosling, also known as the Chop Saver Guy. I am here in a recording studio with the one and only Brian. You know what, I want to stop because tell me how you pronounce your last name. Everybody asks me all the time. I've actually gotten in arguments with people about it. <laughs> so, I mean, if we're going to put this on there, let's just put it on there with me saying it. it it's it's Bal Mages. Bal like pal. You know, I'm your pal. And mages, like, I write music on pages, right? Bal mages, pal pages. So, there you go. So, you're actually putting the accent on the bal... Bal mages, bal mages. right? Okay. Some people say bal mages, bal mages, but it's in there. Bal mages is completely wrong, but that's how everybody says it. Right? <laughs> okay. I've also gotten bal mage, but I'm not a cheese. So, there you go. All right, well, I'm glad we got that out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see if I can do it right. The one only Brian bal mages. That helps, pal. Pages. It does. Bal Mages. Uh, composer extraordinaire. We're actually in the middle of a, just finished up a recording session. I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of. Um, about once a year, Brian will come here with his company, mm -hmm. FJS Music. FJH. FJH, yep. Music. And they will record demo recordings of uh, their latest publications for school band. Um, and it's something that we're fortunate enough to do here in Indianapolis uh, every couple uh couple times a year. So Brian brings both uh, his new compositions and also conducts compositions by your colleagues mm -hmm. at FJH. Um, and they're really terrific stuff. We mm -hmm. all enjoy doing it. Uh, sometimes recording sessions can be a real chore, but they never are uh, with Brian, uh, both with him on the podium conducting, uh, but also just the music itself is always so, um, especially when you're composing for young bands. Mm -hmm. And we as professionals have to kind of remember what it's like to play in the young band situation. Sure. And, and the stuff that you write is so creative, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I did get a few questions uh, from uh, Instagram, from our followers on Instagram. Sure. Um, and one of, one of the gals said, um, she didn't really have a question, then she thought of one. How young did he start composing? She says, he inspired me to start writing my own music, and I wonder how young he was when he first started. I don't have full-time piece done yet. But I do have ideas in my head, and I plan to write out sometime soon. That's great. So, kind of <clears throat> your backstory. Sure. Uh, um, there's a two-part answer to that question. So, uh, the first part is, well, how young was I when I started writing? Um, I play the piano uh, by ear. And, and so, what that means is when I hear something, provided I can remember it. So, I, ha I don't have total recall. But if I hear a piece of music and I can remember it, then I can play it back on the piano without having to rehearse it or practice it or anything like that. Um, and I started doing that as early as elementary school, where I would just hear something, I would play it back on the piano, and that started to lead into I was just hearing little melodies or this or that, or a little fantasy on something, um, and I would play that on the piano. Um, and so what I would do, though, because that wasn't really writing music. I mean, it was kind of, but it was mostly playing music that was Imitating. original. Right. Yeah, what you're um, and so then I started to kind of compose original material, but I never wrote it down. My method of recording when I was young was I would grab a tape recorder. Most of you don't even know what that is anymore. But <laughs> I would grab a recorder, um, and I would record myself playing the tune once I had finished it. Um, and then if I ever forgot it, I could go back and mm. play that back to myself. Right. Right. I would remember it, mm. and then I would be able to play it. Um, the problem was I realized fairly quickly no one's ever going to be able to play my music without me in the room. Um, and so that led to when I started writing music down. Believe it or not, I didn't start writing music down until college. Um, and even in that case, I was writing music for the groups that I was playing in. So if I was in the wind ensemble, I wrote for the wind ensemble. If I played in the symphony orchestra, I wrote for them. I was in the faculty brass quintet, I wrote for them. Um, and, and so it was always writing for groups that I was playing in. And that's kind of how I got my start. I kind of consider, consider myself a late bloomer. I never studied composition formally. I've never taken composition lessons really? formally. No, really? um, I just uh, I learned by doing, uh, and and I probably got the, my biggest education from being in the ensemble and hearing everything around me and what they're able to do, and then just trial and error. Sometimes you write something and it fails, and you learn more. So, when you were a kid, were you taking piano lessons? <laughs> Most of my it was trumpet, and you know I'm a trumpet player. Right. But um, um, so no, I I took piano for six months to a year. Um, I was already playing, right? But um, but I took piano so to try. This was the traditional school band. 
Yeah, my main training was school band. Mm. And then when I got into high school, I started playing in orchestras. But it wasn't until I made it into the All Eastern Orchestra, which mm. was a good orchestra. Nothing against my high school, but we just, you know, right, you right. can only play the same things over and over again so many times. And um, we did the Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances, and um, I got to play principal trumpet on that. And that was life-changing for me. Um, just to play like wow, it's a real, real orchestral repertoire. sound, right, real right, right. and and uh, I learned how much I wanted to play in an orchestra, and I also learned how much I didn't understand about playing in an orchestra, right. um, and so that began my path of orchestral playing, uh, which I did for a while until this whole thing picked up full time, and then I started doing this. So you're in college playing in ensembles, sure, as a trumpet major. No. <laughs> Not so I don't have a comp degree. I don't have a conducting degree. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a lesson right there. Yeah. That's, that's really amazing. Um, so, well, but here it is. I mean, the, the big thing is I, I was a music industry major. Um, I got into college, and I was already writing music. I wanted to learn how to record what I was writing. Okay. I wanted to learn how to make a demo of it. Right. Um, I was also really into where things was like uh, James Madison University okay. for my undergrad. And then... Um, yeah, so I wanted to learn how to do, um, how to record the things that I was doing. I wanted to learn how to write, m use a board, how to do sequencing. Um, but I was really interested in trumpet playing, so I just figured, well, I'm a music industry major, but I'm just going to practice more than all the performance majors, right? Um, because when you're taking an audition, they never ask you, what's your degree program? Right. You just take the audition. And so I would take the audition. Um, and, and I probably learned more from playing than I did from anything, uh, from anything at all. Um, so I'm really glad that I did that. And then I went down to the University of Miami and I did my master's degree in media writing and production, where again, I wanted to learn how to write for different kinds of media, jazz. I wanted to learn how to write for rock. I wanted to learn how to write. I mean, I wrote heavy metal music even, um, a whole wide variety of different things. But even there, um, I was playing very actively. And while down there, I won a job in the Miami Symphony. So I stayed and played in that for a while. Um, until, again, the composing conducting thing really took off and I kind of made a decision that I wanted to really focus on that because I was I was a good trumpet player, but I was not that high on right, the ladder right, right. given where some of these players right, are. Right. So when you say the composing took off, how, do, how does that happen? How do, you, um, how do you go from just sort of it, doing stuff? It, or... it kind of started. So I, all I was writing was for college or above players. But then what happened was all of those people were music ed majors, and they all went off to start teaching. And they started calling me saying, hey, I love what we played of yours in college. You know, could you want, you want to try to write something for my middle school kids? Okay. Do you want to try to write something for my elementary school kids? So, okay, I'll try. So that brings up, um, and I don't want to, because you're, you're on a great role here, but um, the concept of networking or mm -hmm how your network, whether it's your high school buddies or your college buddies, they're the ones that are, that are going to kind of feed your career initially. Sure, uh, sure you want your, your professors and the higher-ups to um, help you out when they can, but it's really your colleagues mm -hmm. that are going to give you those rungs on the ladder, so to speak. To do when something. you're in that environment, that college environment, um, I would like to think that if you're in the right place, you learn as much, if not more, from the people around you, your, your peers as you do from uh, the, the professors that you're learning and taking lessons from. Um, that's kind of a huge thing that molded me. You know, I got into college and number one, I was no longer the big fish. Right. And I learned very quickly, wow, this person can do things that I can't do at all. Mm. And I started, how do you do that? Yeah. Um, and this person could do things that I had never thought about, or this person could write harmonies that I had never heard before. And what do you? And so during that process, learning from all the people around you, um, both in, in ensembles and just in, in life, it was great. So your music education friends mm -hmm. from college go out into the profession, want some new pieces for their kids, right? And that's kind of how it started. Absolutely, absolutely. And and so and not every piece I wrote was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, not at all. So were um, these like? Did you do them as favors, or were they? These were commissions right out of the gate. Uh, or one of my one of my big first so just so people understand when you, you when a composer is commissioned to write a piece right. what does that actually mean uh that, that means a group will contact me and say we like your music we want you to write a piece for us um one of the first groups to ever commission me was my father's community band oh. um <clears throat> and they had heard um a piece of mine that i had done for a film score class um and they really liked it and so they commissioned me i think i made i think i really raked it in and made 200 bucks out of it <laughs> If you're a college kid, that's a lot oh, yeah. of money. Time, Whoa, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so they offered me $200, and I wrote a piece um, 
uh, for them. Uh, and I think this was the one that I wrote for them called Journey by Night. It was this really, really um, bandy kind of piece, and it was fun. Um, and then years later, they commissioned me to write another one. Um, and I wrote a piece for them called Summer Dances. And that was the one that took off. That's mm -hmm. the one that everybody kind played. Um, put you on the and map. Everybody <clears throat> knew it. And, so what year is it? And, uh, that would have been 99. Um, and then we released it in 2000. As a matter of fact, when we put it out, um, it was an afterthought. We had already picked the music that we were going to record. And then at the very end, I said, well, I've got this other piece. I don't know if we're going to have the time to record it. I don't know if we ever even want to publish it. But let's just throw it on if we have time. We did have time. And so we put it on the recording session, and that became one of the biggest pieces that, that I've done. Um, everybody plays it. In fact, so many people have played it that um, when, when everybody was playing it, I wasn't very active as a guest conductor. And once I became active as a guest conductor, um, I would never program it because I had heard it so many times <laughs> that I never programmed it. And so it wasn't until about 2009 that I actually conducted that piece in a concert for really? the first time really? with the Houston Symphonic Band. Yeah. Um, they invited me to come down and guest conduct, and they said, you're probably sick of conducting it, but we've already prepared this piece. We, were, we would like you to conduct it. And I thought about it, and I said, actually, this is going to be my debut performance of the piece. <laughs> and it's been out you know, for nine it's years. It's been out for nine or ten years, so um, yeah, go figure. Um, tell me a little bit about your process. Do you do things just come at you out of the blue? Do you like go into a place where now it's, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to compose now. And there's a, or is it a little no, there's a couple of different things. So I, I used to try to write every piece the exact same way. It's like, well, I must play this way and I must must write this way. Um, and, and then I realized, much like a, um, a performer, when, when you wake up and you're getting ready for the day, or when you're getting ready for, you, you know, to, to play, um, you don't feel the same every day and you change your warm up. Mm -hmm. Some days you've got to warm up a lot longer and spend time on loosening up something. Um, other days, you pick up the horn and you play two notes, and you're like, "I'm great to go." You're good again, um, yeah. And it's no different for me for composing. There's some days that I just think, "Wow, um, I'm so now on that I can just start orchestrating as I go." Right, boom, right in the finale or what's about. It doesn't matter which one you use. I use finale, um, but <clears throat> right in. Um, there are other times that I just enjoy sitting down at the piano and doing what I was talking about playing, where I'll just play for 30 minutes and see what comes out. And then there's other times where I get away from all of that and I'll just sit down at a table with a pencil and paper and I'll just write. Um, there's something so intimate and so organic about having a pe pencil and paper and being able to touch the music that right. you're working on. So without <clears throat> computer off? No computer, yeah. no piano, no nothing. Just me and paper. It's I love it. Do um, <clears throat> So people come to you with a commission. Do they tell you what kind of piece they have in mind or if sometimes it's, if it's... um sometimes it's a opening of a new hall right so um, a like student a... tragically passed away right. we want to celebrate um uh we just had this this moment in our in our county's history um <clears throat> we just want a fanfare um and other times they'll say we just want you to write something um as just this just, long and this yeah. is our instrumentation <clears throat> and... just this is how hard we, we what we can do this is other pieces that we've done um, we don't care what you do. We just want you to go with whatever you feel inside. Um, and sometimes they'll say, let us know if you want suggestions, or they may make some suggestions. Mm -hmm. um, um, the tricky ones are when they say, we were hoping for an oboe solo about a quarter of the way through, and then the <laughs> bassoon can come in. Oh, they're occasionally when they'll say that. But I, I said, well, I, I can do so much, but but I can't you know, you fit that perfect mold. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the questions I had from our Instagram friends was, uh, what's your favorite? What would you recommend for um, grade two through four, with interesting euphonium parts? That wow, was, <laughs> two through four with interesting euphonium. I do. You have a euphonium concerto. Let's start there. Um, okay, it's called Crossroads, um, but that's more like a five or a six. Right. Um, something with interesting euphonium parts. You know, I'd like to think that most of the pieces that I write have interesting parts in general. And I would agree. Um, with that, yeah. Um, you know, there are uh, a few things that I've done. Um, Rippling Watercolor is a lyrical piece um, where there's some interesting things with euphonium. Um, uh, it's really a tricky thing because I don't think particularly about a specific, you know, w which part is. I think about the color of the ensemble um, and, and where the entire ensemble is going. Um, 
So I think you could look at most of them and find something. Um, uh, within the castle walls would be one. I think that's got some interesting euphonium parts. Um, we recorded some today mm -hmm. with some interesting euphonium parts. So, uh, um, when someone um, hmm. asks for a piece, commissions you, what's your time frame? Do you say I need X amount of time to do it, or does it depend on their deadlines, or does it? I'm 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 roughly on a two to two or three year wait really? period right wow. now, roughly. Uh -huh. Um, now there are like okay, so I record with your wife as well, who is uh, Noel, who plays violin, and um, and so that's the orchestral side of things. Um, and so sometimes I may be booked for a year and a half with orchestral music, but I always like to write both every year, mm -hmm. and so there may be an opening for band. Um, and I might be booked out further with orchestra. Or sometimes, in this case, there was a, I'm booked out for band right now for about two, two and a half years, but an orchestra contacted me about doing something for next year, and I happen to have a slot available because mm -hmm. I, I like to do both. I can't exist without one or the other. Right, right. And so that's, that's where that comes from. So in general, two years, um, sometimes seven or eight months, depending on what the piece is. If it's mm -hmm. a grade one, I always like to write one because it's something that I feel like I can give back. Um, so I'm happy to do that. Um, other pieces might be two and a half plus years. So they know that. You say, you I'll ask, tell them. If you ask me now, it's going to be two years before. Yeah, you I mean, and sometimes people say, we're looking for a piece for the fall, and I'll just say, I don't have it. And so um, sometimes they can push it back a few years, or I'll help them find a composer that will fit, meet their needs. Um, so how is how does your relationship with FJH work with just the stuff that you're doing on your own, or things that you want to write just because you want to write. Yeah, so um, a lot of people always ask me, do you own FJ? No, I don't own FJH. Um, so I am the director of instrumental publications. Everything that FJH publishes for band and orchestra, I oversee all of that, and I choose that music. Um, so if you've heard a piece in the last eight or nine, ten years come out of FJH, I selected that for publication. Even if you didn't write it? You Even if I didn't write it. I selected it, and I asked them if I didn't feel like there was something that was working, I asked them to make a change. Or if I felt like, man, I love this piece, but this one section is like three grade levels harder. Um, can we make a change there? Or I might say, hey, I love this piece, but this middle section just doesn't relate to me. I'm having trouble understanding how it makes sense with the rest of the piece. Can you make a change? And so they will. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that's my relationship there. I, I, I first met F FJH stands for Frank J. Hackinson. He's the president of the company. Um, and I first met Frank back in 98. Um, a lot of you probably know the name Robert W. Smith. Um, Robert was at JMU when I was an undergrad there, and I met Robert. Uh, I took his arranging class because all the majors took his class. Mm -hmm. And Robert recommended that I meet with Frank after I graduated. Um, Frank was in Fort Lauderdale. I was going to school in Miami. We were 30 mm -hmm. minutes apart. Connections, so, network. Again. Exactly, <clears throat> yeah. And, and so I like to think that um, uh, I met Frank, and Frank signed me right then as a graduate student. Wow. Um, two years before I published a tune. Um, and so a huge opportunity, right? But, based but, on what he had just seen as you do as a student? Or? Based on what Robert had said and based on the music that he had heard me write. Um, the thing is, though, so it's a huge opportunity, but I would like to think that, yes, it was a huge opportunity, but at the same time, I prepared myself for that opportunity, right? We always talk about, um, well, that would have been a great opportunity, but I wasn't ready. And, and, and so I had seized that time. And um, in undergraduate, um, you're required to graduate with like 120 credits. Um, I graduated with 204. Um, I just went all in. Um, it took me five years, but I was averaging about 24 credits a semester. Whoa. Um, wow. And stuff. And that's just. <clears throat> that's a lot. I, I wanted to learn. <clears throat> you know, I wanted to learn. So you were not as a double major or. No, just... I was not a double major, but I graduated three credits short of a doctorate with an undergrad degree. <laughs> But what, what were the additional classes that I took, right? I wasn't required to take um, two extra semesters of conducting. What do I do for a career? I conduct. Um, I wasn't required to take counterpoint. What did I do? I took it. And what do I do now? I, I do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, there were so many things that I took that I wasn't required to take, right. but I wasn't trying to, it's like, oh, okay, how quickly can, can I just get in and get out and just get done with it to get the paper? Undergrad's not a time to get a paper. Undergraduate, it's time to be a sponge right. and learn everything you can because once you get out there, you are a function of what you've learned and mm -hmm. you will you will tackle the world based on who you are and what you have to offer. Um, and so I want to be able to offer a lot. So that's what I did. That's and I lived to talk yeah. about it. Yeah, you lived to t you lived to tell the tale. I mean that that you said so much there that um, those those of you that are looking at colleges or in college now. Taking full advantage of that environment, the way I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say they took 24 credit hours 
semester after semester after semester. That's mm -hmm. that's a little insane. Insane. I mean, a right. lot of it was ensembles, obviously. Sure. But, but right. even those... still, you know. So yeah, and so you do that, and then you're playing six, seven hours a day. But yeah, I loved it. Yeah, well, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. um, so how many pieces do you think you've written? I so have far? no. Idea. You really don't have any I idea. Don't. Um, I know it's over 100. Oh, it's got to be. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've never been concerned about it. Um, um, the, I know some people are very adamant about knowing exactly how many pieces they've written. Um, for me, I think the moment I realize that I, it's so important to me to know how many pieces I've written, that's a bad moment for me. Because then I'm suddenly worried about, I've written X amount of pieces, okay. and I don't care about that. What I do care about is anything that I've written, I really want to be proud of. I want to be able to say, that's mine. Um, and that's who I am. Not just that's my piece, but that's who I am. That's why I don't write. There's no pen name. A lot of composers use pen names. I do not. Um, I have no pen name. I am who I am. Um, if I feel like I have to put a pen name on a piece, then I don't want to write it. So clearly you've evolved and, and improved as you've mm -hmm. done this all, the, all these years. But you... It sounds like there's not, even nothing in your past that you're like embarrassed about, or gee, I wish I, I was so green. I didn't know what I was doing. It's well, I mean, you know, there are pieces that I look at that I wrote ten years ago that I come back and I look at and I just think like, why in the world did I do that? Why did I write that? Or um, there's plenty of them, um, but I still learn from them, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not embarrassed about looking ten years ago saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe I wrote that. I'm proud because that shows me, wow, look how far I've right, come from right. 10 years ago to now. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited to see, hopefully, where I am 10 years from now, looking back on the stuff that I'm doing right now, right. saying, gosh, why did you do that? Right. Instead of going in this direction. Um, and so um, as an artist, I'm trying to constantly reinvent myself. I'm constantly trying to um, figure out what I can do to be better. What can I do to improve? Um, what have I not done? Not not what did I write that sold a million copies and do it again, mm -hmm. but great, I did that. I'm happy about that. But now, what have I not done? What 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 could I ch what can challenge me? And what would that be for you? Film scores, mm -hmm. um, more more big orchestra stuff. Um... Well, I mean, there 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 there's a lot of things that that I've always been interested in. Eventually, I'm going to tackle my first symphony. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's for orchestra or band, I don't even know yet. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that is on the horizon. Um, I just have to find the right time, mm -hmm. and the right time in the right group, in the right place. Um, and then the other thing that I really want to do is um, I'm just starting a musical. Oh, cool. I want to write a, a full-out musical. So you've got a storyline in mind? I do. I got the working whole, with somebody? Or this uh, is just... Right now I'm not working with somebody, but I've got, um, I, I'm connected with uh, um, a, a person, I'll just say a person who um, uh, has done a lot of work on Broadway. Okay. Um, and, and we were connected, and, uh, and so I'm just kind of reaching out for some thoughts and stuff, but we're aware of each other. Um, yeah. And so it's something I've always wanted to do. I yeah. grew up going to musicals. It's, mm -hmm. it's part of who I am. I love to sit down and just play the piano and, and have fun. Um, and, but and you're essentially so, self-taught as a pianist. Completely, yeah. Did you take piano as an undergrad? I mean, a class piano, or did you have a piano? I took a semester because we had to. Right. Proficiency, yeah, right? Right. But that was that's it. No. Okay, that's crazy in itself. But um, uh, there was another question. I'm just going to try. Have, no, it's not set up, is it? What the piano? Yeah. No, it's behind a baffle. We can't get to it. Okay. Were you going to prove it? No, I was going to prove it, but we'll see. <laughs> um, question was, what were you thinking when he composed his work Fusion? It was absolutely crazy to play it, and I loved every minute of it. So yeah. not only that piece, but other pieces. What are you... The, I mean, because you have very interesting titles. Your yeah. titles are fun and, and um, evocative. Did the titles come last? Did the titles... No, Fusion came first. I knew exactly what I wanted to write. Okay. Um, um, Fusion was all about the way I grew up. So I, I grew up listening to classic rock. Um, you know, I grew up listening to U2, to Billy mm -hmm. Joel, to, um, you know, just a lot of these great And your parents artists. were musical? Or... Yeah, my parents were both Peabody Conservatory graduates. Okay. My father was a trumpet player. My mother was an opera singer. Um, and, and so um, neither wrote music, really, but they, that, they were performers. Right, right. And music teachers. Um, my father was my elementary band director, and he was my wife's elementary band director three years later. Wow. How awkward, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so um, when, um, what was even the question? <laughs> Fusion. Oh, yeah, that's right. I wrote a piece called Fusion. 
Um, and so I grew up listening to all these artists. And then I got to a point where I started to say, you know what? I love this idea of jazz and I love rock. And I'll, why can't I add that into my concert music without it being a hokey jazz piece right. or a rock piece? Right. I wanted to be something that you could play at a festival or at a, at serious contest music um, or concert music, but at the same time had a huge jazz and rock influence. And so that's where that piece came from. That's one of the first pieces that I wrote that I truly in integrated all those things, particularly in the last movement, so, which is a movement called fusion. Right. So you have electric instruments in there? Do you nope. have No or electric in there. No, I've written for electric. Well, mm -hmm. your your wife recorded one of my electric right, pieces right. Yeah, for electric yeah. uh, string quintet and, yeah. and orchestra, um, but um, no, no electric electronics in there. A um, couple other questions, and it would be more about um, where do you see yourself maybe ten years from now? Uh, I would like to think that. Uh, Number one, I am writing something that I've never written before. Uh, and, that I'm, and clearly, it, music education is really important to you. It so, is very important to me, um, and, and but so is is um, uh, level of performance. And right. so, um, you know, I, I certainly love writing educational music, but at the same time, I love going out there and conducting. You know, some of the best all state bands that are out there. Mm -hmm. Um, this summer I was in uh, Australia conducting an orchestra down there and just having a great time. Um, and, and so I love pushing myself uh, in front of incredible musicians mm -hmm. and seeing how much I can draw out of them um, and how much I can learn from myself in the process. Um, learn about myself, I should say. And, and so, um, you know, 10 years from now, I want to be able to say all those things. But probably mo most important, um, right now I've got a 9-year-old and 11-year-old boy. And I can say this now about the last 10 years. But 10 years from now, I think probably the most important thing is I want to be able to say that I have no regrets about being their dad. Right. Um, I, I don't want to have traveled so much that I missed out on things. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have been gone so much that I have to re-meet my wife. Um, and <laughs> Because this does involve some travel. It does. Yeah. Um, and so far, I've been able to manage a very good balance of those things. And, and that's I think that connection to my family is one of the things that makes me so creative. Uh, and and so I want to be able to look back on that in ten years and say, I have no regrets. Right, I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the, I I, I understand that it's hard. Yeah, it, it's very hard. A musician's life can be full of travel. It can be an incre incredible way to make a living. But it, uh, the time demands are crazy sometimes. Right. And if you if you add into that the fact you have to be on the road, you've got to conduct here. You've got this uh, organization that's hired you to come out and and present or right are you teaching anywhere right now? i'm teaching uh adjunct yeah so i teach at towson university which is in baltimore um nice size university uh 10 minutes door to door gotta love that yeah. um and and so i do teach there as their assistant director of bands and orchestra so i work with the band and the orchestra there um and um they're conducting, great not conducting totally. conducting correct um, and, and so I, I enjoy my time there. I mean, I've got a great uh, relationship with the director of bands, Chris Ciccone, um, and uh, he's doing some great things there. We think very much alike. We conduct very similar, um, and so it's been really, really great to be a part of that, but at the same time, they give me the freedom of being able to be who I need to right, be as well. Right, right. Um, well, this has been fantastic. I mean, I yeah, absolutely. I appreciate for, it. For hours, um, but I know we should probably wrap this up, but I just maybe... Um, for aspiring young conductors uh -huh. or composers, sure. Um, what do you What are you telling them? What are you telling them? I mean, your road you you came from a musical family, mm -hmm. which certainly helps, um, as as did I. And I know people that have a passion for music, but they didn't have the same environment that maybe you and I did mm -hmm. growing up. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, clearly, if you missed the first part of this interview, go back and listen to what Brian said about how he handled his undergraduate. But just in general, what are you telling aspiring conductors about you know, the, the, the job scene, um, how to find their own voice? Sure. Know, what do you tell people? Well, conductors and composers or both? Let's go both. If you, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, on the composition side, I tell people, number one, um, if you, you're only going to do as much as you believe you can do, right? Um, and, and, and so if you want to write, write. Um, 
when I was in high school, my guidance counselor told me you may want to consider doing something different because most people don't make it in the world of music and you should do something else where you can make a living. Um, seven or eight years later, I came back to my high school and I spoke for the National Honor Society induction. They had me back because of my success in the music industry. Right. Thank yeah. goodness I didn't listen to her. Right. Right? <laughs> exactly. Um, follow your heart. Um, that's a big part of it. Um, in addition, write. If you want to be a composer, write music. Write it. Um, you're going to write some bad music. I wrote some bad music. Okay? I learned more from writing bad music than I did from writing good music. And I would also point out the way Brian wrote it was, you know, you recorded you mm -hmm. sat down and played mm -hmm. tunes as they came to you. You, right. you wrote in many different ways. I wrote in many different ways, but everything I wrote, I heard. Right. So I would get friends together, and if I, if, if you want to compose music, and your best friend plays horn, and, and your other best friend plays flute, write a piece for horn and flute. Get them to play it. Mm -hmm. You'll find things that are great about it and things that are terrible about it. I was in a trumpet ensemble. I wrote a piece for trumpet ensemble. There were things that I thought were great. There were things that I thought were terrible. Um, the, the terrible things were when I realized that I had re I had written the whole thing at the piano using the sustain pedal. Right. <laughs> Trumpet ensemble doesn't have a sustain pedal. It sounded like garbage when I got to that part. And then I had to learn about leaving a trail of sound that is sustained right. as the other trumpets go on. Yeah. Um, but I learned a lot from that. Right. So um, write. Listen to um, uh, a lot of music. Get scores. Um, if it's classical scores, you can go on to IMSLP, you know, and and, and download PDFs. Um, you can uh, purchase P uh, scores for six, seven bucks uh, online um, for band pieces that you're playing or for orchestra pieces that you're playing. Take the score, listen to the music while you have the score in front of you. Um, it's important that you go out and purchase a score. Don't just try to get a PDF of it and just um, get it for free. And the only reason I mention that is because that's how I support my family. Right? And so if you're out there trying to get a score for free, if everybody did that, I would then have to find a new job. Um, and so that's the only reason I mention that. Whenever I go, I, I buy everything. Um, uh, I don't even go to the library and rent, um, uh, check out books. I buy them uh, right, just yeah. because I want to support the artists mm -hmm. as much as I can. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that I do. Um, and then as a conductor, again, as many opportunities as you can, get in front of an ensemble. Even if it's three players, four players, practice conducting in front of a mirror. Get yourself video recorded as much as you can. Even record yourself conducting to nothing or mm -hmm. record yourself conducting to your favorite movie soundtrack or whatever it may be. Um, you'll learn a lot by doing that. And that's kind of how I got going. Do you have a website? Yes, uh, Brian Balmages, ba Balmages, Balmages. dot com. Yeah, and and I, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Well, Facebook, I'm Max, but I mean, I have a Facebook artist page. But I'm also on Twitter. Uh, I'm Brian Balmages. Brian Balmages. Brian. Bal I'm the only Brian Balmages in the world. Search for me, and you'll find me. There's only one. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brian Balmages, this has been an absolute pleasure. Hey, thank you so much. For absolutely, Dan. Me. Thank you. He still sounds great, by the way. Oh, well. It's easy when the music is written so well. So with that, we'll say thank you. Thanks for watching and look for more great stuff from Brian and from Chopsaver. Bye.